Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the NFL Alumni Lounge. And today we have royalty. We have royalty joining us today in the building. We have Mr. Prince, hey. DJ Daniel, stepping in. And we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, The Mindfulness for the Ultimate Athlete, Mastering the Balance Between Power and Peace. Ooh. Prince, what's shaking? Hey, man, everything, man. Life is good. You know, I'm making sure that I stay safe and stay out of harm's way. But um, everything is, is lovely, man. What's shaking with you? Not much, man. I appreciate the book. I got myself a signed copy over here in the lounge. And uh, it, it's powerful. I told you this, and I mean this wholeheartedly. Yeah. I think that for you to tackle the subject matters that are tackled in this book, yeah. it's powerful. It's you stepping outside of yourself. It's you. There's no ego involved in this. And it's just something that was made to help other people because you saw a darkness and lived in a darkness you didn't want others to experience. So take us to where the idea for this book came from and the energy that went into creating it. Oh, um, thank you for that, man. I'm, I'm, thank you for putting me on this platform, being here. Um, yeah, so, man, after football, you know, a lot of athletes would go through this transition in life where there's no program or anything set up for us to actually have a, a, a good transition. And um, for the most part, what we have to do is learn how to figure it out on our own. So I went through this process where I became, I had a self-identity crisis, became extremely depressed. And then after that, um, after I became extremely depressed, you know, the suicidal ideation came. Now, and where did it start? Where did the depression start? There was that, you're stud at Georgia Tech. You go to the league, you have a rough time when uh -huh. you enter the league. Where did yeah. the depression, where did these thoughts start for you? Or was it lifelong? No, it, it no, it happened after I was let go. I was discharged from the NFL because I didn't get a chance to live out my dream, you know, live out my plan. And so when that happens, when when your idea and plan do not align with the, the, the desired success, then there there's a void that's created. And once that void is created, you know, you're looking around after after you're, you're, you're done with the game and you're asking yourself, like, who am I? You know, and instead of, you know, drowning yourself in alcohol and drugs, man, um, you have to really do some some deep internal, you know, like, question. Yeah. You know, you have to ask yourself, exactly, like, what? why am I here? What's my purpose after this? Because, you know, football is a very big stage for us. And then after we're let go, it's just like, okay, what else are you going to be able to find to have that energy to keep you going uh, in life. And if you don't want to get into broadcast or stay in the NFL arena, then guess what? Then you have to figure out what's life for you after after the game. And so the energy that went, in, in, went into it is that whenever all of these things happened to me, um, I said to myself, if I get out of this, I'm going to make sure I put something together for everyone so they have a roadmap and a life aid that they can um, use and an instruction manual that they can use to help them reach their peak performance beyond the game. Now, before we get into the book and everything within it, this is important. This is a subject at the NFL alumni that's very near and dear to our hearts because it's the biggest struggle that our guys face. You right. leave the league, like you just said, the biggest platform in the world, and now back to civilian life. And it's an extremely hard adjustment for everyone. Right. Um, when taking this on, Take us into take us into how your NFL career wrapped up. Like, mm. walk us through those steps because there's guys dealing with that today. Oh yeah. So, man, it was my my third year. I was going into my contract year, mm. and everything was hitting on all cylinders. I just spent time at a monastery and came back, and I was ready to zen on everybody, man. Wow. And uh, during during uh, um, camp. During camp, and we were getting ready for the season, I ended up running the play, and I tripped over my own foot, and I tried to put my arm down to stop my momentum, and I tore my labrum. And from tearing my labrum, man, I had to make that decision. Either I, I play through it or I get surgery. And I decided to get the surgery. So shortly after that, uh, Matt, Matt Stover, the kicker, um, he came and I think he was a player's rep, the the, the yeah, the player rep on, the on the team. Yeah, the PA. 
Uh, well, no, he was still he was he was a representation for the Baltimore right, Ravens. Side, yeah. Right, exactly. And so he was asking me about my four hundred one k and everything else, and I was just like, "What are you what, what are you talking about, man? Like, <laughs> like man, my career is not over, man." Right. But he's you know he's seen it so many times, and so he was trying to prep me for that exit process, and I was wow. still in denial. I was still you know, like, "No, I, I get I have another opportunity." And um, so, and, and this was my, my first year, my rookie year. I didn't get a chance to play because they, they wanted to make sure that I, I developed because they saw a lot of potential in me. My second year, um, hurt, injured myself, hamstring, wasn't a, a, a career-ending injury. They put me on IR back then. You, you're not able to get taken off of IR. So I had to sit out the whole season. Then the third year came along, and I tore my labrum. And so it looks like on paper I'm injury-prone. Uh, so from there, uh, um, I, I did my rehabilitation. But one thing I did not do was I didn't stay with the Baltimore Ravens when I did my rehabilitation. I went to Atlanta, Georgia, um, my alma mater, Georgia Tech, and I and I got my surgery done in Atlanta, and I did my rehab there. But after rehab, I just kind of stayed, you know, by myself. I sequestered myself from everyone. I got a one bedroom apartment. It was just me and my dog. And and I said to myself, I'm gonna I'm gonna build my mind, my body, and my spirit back. But the thing that I did not do was com- continue to communicate with the team and let them know what was going on because it some separation there. It was some, some separation. And see, I was young, and my feelings was hurt. Like my, I was emotionally bruised, physically bruised. I was just trying to bring it all back together. Like, who am I? Like, all right, I know who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a great NFL or a running back. And now, what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, go and run in the woods and and meditate and and then come back and be stronger than ever. And so, when I came back, uh, they said that they were that they were going to go in another direction. And from there, I was shocked. So I had a plan. Again, I had a plan for myself and. I thought this plan was going to work out, but when I went back, they had other plans, and it was like a relationship. Like you, you know, you leave you leave your girl too long, and um, you come back, and she's with Jody. You know? Where'd she go? Where'd <laughs> yeah, she no. go? right, right. She's with Jody now, <laughs> baby boy. And you might have to, and you might have to fight Bing Rames in the form of a team. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, but but it's but it's incredible. So so you're going through all this, and that's a good piece of advice I think for current players because a lot of guys when they're dealing with injury. They do have that that tear, that little split decision is, do you want to be in your pro city or do you want to go to your college city or your home city? Um, right. And that's a big point you just made. Maintain strong communications with the team uh, if you do choose to go the other route. Yeah. Now, this is a guy, folks, you, you got to realize, you're a walk-on at Georgia Tech, um, then then you're a later round draft pick. And mm-hmm. every, so it's like every phase of life for you, there was a challenge, yeah. but you had a way of, not fearing a challenge, running through the challenge, breaking records, and creating a path for yourself. So that was always your mentality. Right. You said while you were playing, like second year, you were you went to a monastery and everything. So you were very in tune with your soul and your your mental game. Right. Where did that come from? Was that part of your upbringing or? Uh, yeah. So my, my father, he was a black belt. And oh, really? Yeah. So he practiced um, meditation as well. But um, he never really got a chance to to teach me, but I would see him like just sitting down and just. Would he meditate daily and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, he would. He would. He would wake up extremely early and just sit and just just sit in his chair and just look around. And you come in and he's just you're looking at him and you're like, yes. You know, it's it's like that awkward moment. Like, uh, are you going to say something, Dad? You just stared at me. (laughs) And um and I had two uncles that were really into um, evolving them themselves you know, mentally and spiritually. And so it was easy for me to follow suit. And I started practicing a little bit during high school, but it never stuck. And college never really stuck with me. And then it wasn't until um, when I was in the NFL, you know, my sole purpose to practice meditation at that point in time was like to separate myself from you know like they're, they're good players they're great players and then they're the elite right mm-hmm. and so I was in my mind how do you beat the elite and see Ray Lewis Bart Scott they used to help me elevate my game so much because what I realized was that I have an opportunity to go against a number one defense every single day yeah. and if I can I if I can go super hard and beat them every day when I go against the number two, number three, number four, number five, 
like the number 32 team, I'm going to have a field day. So I knew that I was on a pathway to 2000 yards in my mind because I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, and, and, and when that opportunity did not present itself, you know, it was crushing for me. So, yeah, yeah man. So, um, uh, for the most part, you know, I, I had to learn how to, uh, really tap into who I am and, and the spiritual side, you know, I was groomed at a young age, but I started leaning more on more into it when I, when I, when I, when I got older from watching all these Kung Fu movies, right, you know, right. the five deadly venoms and Hey, Hey, right. <laughs> you know, all, all of these, these great um, uh, Kung Fu movies, Bruce Lee movies. Um, I, I started seeing that they, they had this, this unique power that they were able to tap into and they talk about it, but you know, I, I wanted to live into it and see if that was real. And uh, sure enough, if you continue to keep working on something, mining it, uh, eventually you'll find that gold. And become water, folks. Number mm. one lesson, become water. <laughs> become now, water. <laughs> before, <laughs> before we talk the light, it's it's great because you can see the book cover behind them and there it's light. So yeah. before we talk the light, let's talk the dark. Take us now to the lowest point, which you address head on here in the book. When you started having suicidal thoughts, there was a magic moment for you that you, you were telling me it, it did, you know, you, it saved your life. Take us to that moment. What were you feeling? What saved you? And what gave you the will to keep moving? Oh, man. Um, so when I was in a dark moment, I created a three day plan for my demise. And what I was going to do was uh, basically um, point blank, just you know, look to blow my head off. Um, and so I, I, I had a gun in my house, um, a shotgun. And uh, basically I just was just like, I, I, I said the first day, um, I'll just pull the trigger on myself and see how it feels and try to embody that feeling. Then the second day I would, um, scattered the bullets out um, on the floor just to see, uh, just to look at that, but still pull the trigger. And the third day was the day to load, load the gun. Um, so on that third day, I decided to call um, seven people. And I called these seven individuals. And the first six did not tell me what I wanted to hear. I felt that I was in my own space. No one could understand me. Uh, I called one of my teammates. He, he you know, I, I, and that was the first time where I really experienced some happiness. And then he, he, he had to get back to work. He had to go back. He's just like, hey, man, I got I to gotta get back. It's good talking to you, bro. Love you, man. And no one knew that I was struggling. I was going through a self-identity crisis. And so the seventh individual was um, um, the, 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 the guru at the monastery. And I started lamenting to him about, everything that I was going through, um, my hurt, um, how I lost my job, how I lost my woman, how I lost my condo, just all, all the things that going on in life. And after I finished, he paused and I, and I felt myself exhale. And he said, are you done? I was like, oh, am I, am I, am I, am I, am did you not hear what I just said? <laughs> and it just minimized everything that I was saying and just told me to meditate and hung up the phone. And, you know, I'm like, I am struggling here. I need an answer. Right. And so I had to have faith in, um, and, and, and when I say I had to have faith, I had to, this was my last option. So uh, even if I did not have faith, I, there, there, there was some, the last reasoning in my mind before I go and horn myself, uh, let me go and sit down. So I was told, okay, meditate. This is completely, yeah, it was unfamiliar. And, um, and what I mean by unfamiliar is just like, it was an unfamiliar, untraditional answer. Right. Like go, go and practice meditation. So I did, I sat down, I sat down for one hour, man. And within that one hour, um, I had saw something, um, the last few minutes, but during the whole meditation, I was struggling, I was struggling and struggling. And, um, I found silence and peace and I heard myself talking, you know, to myself, um, like, what are you doing? And the third time I asked myself that, it was just like, what 
are you doing? And my answer was like, I'm, I'm about to, what? I'm about to horn myself. And then from there, I just, it was like, a, it was like a dream and I just got sucked out of it. And from that moment, I was just like, what was that? What was that? What, what was that? So I had tears streaming on my face. I was like, what was that? What was that? You know, because you don't ever think that meditation can help you. And it's just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it was, I was so em uh, emotionally like invested in uh, harming myself. Like I was willing to throw my emotions into anything mm -hmm. and it opened something up inside of me. And I realized, wow, there was a, there was this level of peace that you can reach. And when you reach it, like you become addicted to it right away because it's, it's like a drug, but it's not a drug. And it's like mm -hmm. the all, you know, you know, and it's like the all time high. And so from there, I followed that. And I said, this is what I want to follow for the rest of my life. And, um, and, and that's how that happened. Mind, body, and soul is a phrase that we always hear. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize how real it is because right. it's like we have these brains in our head. It's mm -hmm. almost like an alien came and you know, it was put in this body, you know? Right. And, and it, it, the power of it, man, like the title of the book, the balance right. between power and peace. Yeah. So now as a guy, college stud, becomes a pro athlete, when you talk to younger athletes and, you know, just young kids growing up, when, when it comes to physical exercise, lifting, sprinting, all that, what percentage of their time should also be put into their mind? Because I feel like we don't really, we don't really talk about that or train that that much. Right. Um, so the percentage should be 30%, should be 30% body, 30% mind, 30% spirit. Um, and and the reason why is because you want everything to be equal, or should I say 33%. Right. Yeah. And uh, since we're so familiar with what goes on in the body, you know, we've studied that for years and years, we need to, be, we need to start becoming more equipped on what's going on in the body. I mean, I'm sorry, in the mind. Right. And then, then from there, we need to start becoming more equipped on what's going on in our spirit. Because, um, it, it, there's something that we that we possess that we have and we have to wake up with it every day so it's it's you can think of it as fitness you know when you go to the gym you warm up and then you work your body out mm -hmm. um for the mind the mind if you if you consider you know you can use another situation for the mind um as like the gym uh you you, you get a book you read it exercise your mind mm. when and when it comes to practicing mindfulness or meditation, which is not a religion, uh, what happens is you start tapping into your spirit and listening to your, your intuition, your mm -hmm. inner gut, you know, your gut, that gut feeling that's always talking to you. But a lot of times, you know, it's like a moment where it's temptation and you hear your gut. Yeah, it's, it's like the little, you know, the little, little angel. Good and evil on you. Talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good and evil on your shoulders. It's just like, are you going to do it? Don't do it. Like, right. You know, you're not supposed to do it. And you're like, ah, I'm going to do it anyway. And yeah. so when you do that, that weakens that, um, that gut feeling, that intuition. Mm -hmm. And the more and more you weaken it, the more and more the other side gets stronger and you start listening to that and you start uh, digging a hole for yourself. And eventually when you realize like, man, I'm in a dark place, like how, how do I get out? And um, since you had forgot about your intuition, mm. you know, like now you have to sit and wait for it to like reveal itself, unveil itself again. And once it does, it's like, where have you been this whole time? Like I've been here, but you kept, you, you kept, you know, oppressing me, pushing me down right. and getting rid of me. And, and, but I'm, I've always been here. I'm here. So um, let's figure this out. And when, when you start figuring out, you got to remember what got you out of that hole. Uh, and, and so um, when any temptation comes, which is something that, that that's it's temporary gratification, mm -hmm. temptation, temp, temporary gratification, uh, you have to remember what the uh, long-term goal is. What's your purpose? What are you here for? How are you going to help from this point on? You know, I think our everyone's purpose is to 
help each other evolve. And you just have to find a creative way to do it. You know, whether that's being um, a moderator, whether that's being a speaker, whether that's being uh, a, um, a, a football player, a basketball player, or athlete in general, you know, a business person, a lawyer, and the list goes on. Just find a way to be able to help people evolve and become the best version of themselves. So now you take all this and when, when did, first of all, that was one of the coolest ways I've ever heard that explained. And that's something guys, if anybody listening with children, what a way to explain it. It's like, you, you just made me picture walking on a balance beam and I'm holding a stick and there's two buckets and the bad decisions, you keep making bad decisions. Whoop, you're going to fall off. You're going to be right in a dark place. Um, man, I, 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 first of all, I, I think everybody that's watching this is thinking this guy should be a coach. Um, but when did the pen hit the paper? When did the writing process start? And, you know, we know NFL guys, right? We're always around them. And it's, it's the toughest guys around. A lot of guys aren't going to say, I want to talk about my weakest moments. It's just not going to happen. So when did that come to you? Was that a hard barrier to cross over? Um, man, that came to me when I... You know, it was after my, my father passed. Mm. Um, when was that? Um, that was in 2013. I, and I had to go to Ghana, Africa to bury him. Oh, wow. And I, <clears throat> I had to go to the morgue and identify his body. And, right? And so that was like, that was, that was a moment in my life where I realized, like, this is bigger than me. Yeah. And so being ashamed of, telling my story of what happened and how I was able to overcome it. It's just me, it's just my ego um, saying, oh man, you know, you, you gotta be strong. And I realized the, to master the balance between your power and peace, you know, there's a balance between your masculinity and your feminine side as well. And so a lot of times we're concerned about what others are gonna say when you've already put in the work to become the macho man. Wow. But how, how long are you going to, are you going to continue to be the macho man? Like um, th there needs to be a balance because sometimes whenever we, we we are trying to power our way through things, you know, we can be very destructive. Mm -hmm. But but when um, if there's too much peace, we can be very passive. So you want to find that 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 middle point where you're able to maintain the balance and the peace. Just be like water. Mm -hmm. you know, water can Fire be meets ice right there. <laughs> That's it, man. Oh. Exactly. It's just it's it can be a force. It can conform to you know a um a object, but it can also be very powerful and flowing. So uh once I started understanding that, <clears throat> then I, I got over the fact of like looking like um I was weak because I realized that I was really powerful in mm -hmm. sharing this because there are a lot of people that are like, wow, hey huh. Like, wow, they said that. I, I feel like that, man. I feel like that, man. Yeah. And and then that wakes them up and they start realizing like, man, you know what? I'm not that weak. I'm not, I've, I've accomplished this. It's only a, 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 a small percentage of people that have accomplished what I've accomplished. So now what, what am I doing now? What am I doing now? Like if I have kids, how am I going to teach them to avoid this pitfall? I don't want them to go through the same thing because if we don't talk about it, you know, because it seems like it's a taboo and it makes us weak, then guess what? The next in, next individual is going to experience the exact same thing, um, and and they they could lead to uh, it could lead to a catastrophe, you know. Right. And so we want to avoid that. And so I I just said to myself, you know what? I'm I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to be brave and make the attempt to do it because uh, if I do that then I can live with myself at night. And that's, that's when I did that, man. And, and then that's when I started putting the, 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 the pen to the pad. And I said to myself, I'm going to write a book that's a life aid. So people can read the book, you know, at, at uh, 25, at 30. And then at 35, they, 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 they get a different meaning because yeah. of what are in their life, you know, and they perceive things differently. And so from that point on, they will be able to grow with this book and it'll allow for them to, to reach their, um, their, 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 their best versions of themselves.
Absolutely. That's really cool that you said that because after reading the book, that's how I felt. It almost feels like um, like a deep breath. Like it's one of those books that you read it and it really does make you feel good. And you're right. You can pick it up probably two years later or five years later. And you're right. You're going to look at it different, but you're going to take on because like Prince right now is talking about his personal challenges. But when you read this book, you're going to be applying it to your personal challenges. Right. And it really is like, it's almost like an instruction manual for the spirit in a way. Right. <laughs> um, so I really, I think you did a great job on it. Um, again, guys, the book is out now. Mindfulness for the ultimate athlete, mastering the balance between power and peace. And it's funny how that naturally do that, right? It puts up, you put up the gloves. Right. <laughs> So for people that do pick up the book, yeah. what do you want them to take out of it once it's put down? Wow. Um, uh, you just received the knowledge. Now go and apply it. Mm. You know, um, because a lot of times uh, you hear people say, oh, man, oh, that was a cool book. But, you know, um, I don't have time for meditation. Right. You know, I, don't, I don't have no time for that, man. I got all these other things going on, you know. Um, Got three hours for Instagram swiping today. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And yeah. so what I tell people is then, okay, you say that you don't have any time for meditation. Um, what are the first two letters in, in the word meditation? M-E. M-E. I said, so so let's take the dation out medi- and, and let's, let's say that phrase again. I don't have time for me. Mm. And see, it hits a little different, Charlie. Yeah, it does. Because now it's just like, you keep saying that, you're like, I don't have time for me, I don't have time for me, then eventually you won't have time for you. But the minute you start saying, I have time for me, and you make time for you, then it becomes true as well. And so what I teach people are the things that you say to yourself, you know, because what I realized uh, during my realization is that what I was saying to myself, you let yourself down. You're not enough. I can't believe you did this. You lost your first job. You lost your, you lost a professional job. Like what's wrong with you? You are crazy. Uh, and, exactly. Exactly. And burying myself in my misery. And then from there, I started actually making an attempt to speak to myself in a positive manner. And I started realizing like my mood started lifting mm. and I was just like, wow, like, man, words are really powerful. Yeah. Like, like they're more powerful than, than we think, you know? And so when I started becoming more mindful of like how I was talking to myself, instead of me saying, Oh yeah, I'm trying. I started saying I'm doing, mm. you know, because there's, again, there's levels to this. So you go from I'm trying to, uh, or, or this is what I want to do to I'm trying to do this to, I think I'm doing this to I'm doing this. And once you start doing it, you start living into it. And whenever you start living into it, then you can be uh, 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 like a uh, um, a mentor or a catalyst for others, and 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 share with them um, how to avoid the pitfalls, so they can, you know, elevate themselves. Man, again, it, I go back to everyone's overall purpose is to help each other grow and evolve and become the best versions of ourselves. Absolutely. And that's what you've done. This book is a catalyst for all. Um, Prince, thank you so much for taking the time out with us. Thank you for writing this book. And also, guys, be sure to check out Game Beyond Game. If you follow Prince on social media, um, his Instagram is Prince ADJR. And um, tell him a little bit about Game Game Beyond Game. Because we just yeah. got a little dose of Game Beyond <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. So actually, Game Beyond the Game was just like uh, events and experiences uh, pre-COVID. But when COVID happened, you know, we, we decided to uh, Audible. pivot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> you had to pivot and, and, and go to um, uh, the virtual world. And so now I get an opportunity to interview um, players, former players, and, I, and they share their, their stories about transition and inspiration and purpose that they found in life. And what this does, it helps the other athletes, the up and coming athletes or the former athletes that are kind of afraid to come out. Um, and once they get a chance to see it, they're like, oh, man, this is good. Like, I play with that guy. Oh, I know that guy. You know, so there's a, an emotional connection, but also they're like, man, he just told that story. I need to tell my story. Mm-hmm. And so the guys come in and w- what um, they, they tell their story or the guys and the gals yeah. uh, and they tell their story. And once they tell their story, man, it, it impacts 
all these other athletes that want to share their stories as well and what they've learned over the years and give them these antidotes and, and, and these remedies. Like if you practice this or if you do this, man, this is going to help you uh, get out of your own way. And so Game Beyond the Game um, is, is, is a platform where I help athletes, you know, find their purpose, their vision, and have the mindset to carry it out and live to it. Absolutely. Guys, be sure to check out Game Beyond the Game and pick up the new book, Mindfulness for the Ultimate Athlete, Mastering the Balance Between Power and Peace. PJ, thank you so much, man. Oh, man, Charlie Boots, man. Thank you so much, man. You the man, man. You the man. <laughs> guys, if you read the book, you could be the man. Or the woman. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, um, um, I want to tell everybody, go to my website, uh, yeah. www.princedaniels jr.com um i have some incredible things coming up man like 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 really incredible things just helping people unlock uh their mind to reach their peak performance you know like become the best versions of themselves and i'm doing it through a lot of inspiration and um mm -hmm. i have a new podcast that just came out um it's called the prince daniels jr show it's on apple uh podcast and spotify and i got my audio book for the book so if you don't feel like reading the book you can check out my audio <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can listen to the book, man. And so, but yeah, but but thank you so much for this opportunity, man. Because all I'm I'm here to do is, you know, help each help us evolve, man. Um, this is a a space that hasn't really been tapped into, and I'm here to make sure that not just you know our our, our NFL brothers uh, get this this dosage of of remedy, but mm -hmm. also other athletes because we all go through that same transition, and it's just like, well, what's next? You know, can can we can we get much higher? And it's just like, actually, you can, you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, get in tune with the Prince. Hey. <laughs> I love it. Right? Uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs>